my name is Mrs. Stanford and I'm going to teach you another lesson in ASL. Today we're going to focus on the history of the language and how it came about. While there's not a lot of history dating back a long time ago, one of the most popular uh, parts of history that you can find about sign language originated on an island off the coast of Massachusetts called Martha's Vineyard. I have a picture right here. And on this island, there were a group of settlers that came to live there. And one of those settlers was named Jonathan Lambert. And he was born in 1694. Now he ended up carrying a gene for deafness. And because most of those people on the island stayed on the island, um, when it came to different marriages over the years, um, there was possible incest. And because of that, from generation to generation, this gene for deafness was carried down. And so they had a large population of deaf people on the island. And because of that, they ended up creating their own form of sign language called Martha's Vineyard Sign Language. Now, this was used by both the hearing and the deaf. It was almost like its own utopia where everyone was able to communicate with everyone. Um, hearing people, while they did use um, spoken English, they also used Martha's Vineyard Sign Language to communicate. So when you went to town meetings or church services or just had local gatherings at your post office or general store, everyone was using sign language. Um, kids who were born there would grow up learning sign language both from hearing adults as well as deaf adults. So this island became bilingual. However, when you look at the states, the mainland states, there weren't large groups of deaf people using sign language in the states. And in fact, the majority of deaf children were born to hearing adults who didn't know what to do with their child. And at that time, a lot of people thought that the deaf were, were dumb or that they weren't smart enough to be able to communicate. Um, and although that was sad, um, that was just part of the ignorance of that time. And so if we fast forward just a little bit, there was a man by the name of Thomas Hopkins Gallaudet. And he was born December 10th, 1787. He was born in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, but he moved to Hartford, Connecticut. And this is Thomas Gallaudet. Now he grew up in Hartford and he went on to go to Yale University. And after graduating from Yale University, he then decided that he was going to become a minister. So we set off to do that. And during, the one, during one of the times that he came back home from seminary, he happened to be watching out the window of his home, and he saw his brothers and his sisters playing outside, and then he happened to notice this little girl. Her name is Alice Cogswell. And he noticed that she was out there all alone. No one was playing with her, and she was not playing with anyone. So he became curious as to why she was all alone. Why weren't his brothers and sisters playing with her? So he ended up going outside to find out more. And when he did that, he discovered that this young girl was deaf. And being that he wanted to be able to communicate with her, he decided that maybe he would try. So he walked up to the little girl and he pointed to the hat on his head. And then he picked up a stick and he drew and wrote the letters H-A-T in the dirt or in the sand there. And he pointed to his hat and he got Alice to understand that those written letters on the ground were connected to the meaning of what was on his head. And thus he was able to see that, you know what, this young deaf girl 
She can learn to communicate. She can understand. She's not dumb. She just needs someone that would take the time to find a way to communicate with her. And because Alice was so excited that she had learned a word, that someone had communicated with her, that the two of them went to Dr. Cogswell, her father. His name was Mason Cogswell. And he happened to be a wealthy surgeon. And through the discussion between Thomas Gallaudet and Dr. Cogswell, Dr. Cogswell showed his great appreciation that he had for Thomas Gallaudet and trying to communicate with his daughter and expressing that she can, in fact, communicate and learn that he wanted to fund a trip for Thomas Gallaudet to travel to Europe to learn how to communicate with the deaf and then bring those teaching methods back to America in order to start a school for the deaf here in America. And Thomas Gallaudet thought about it and decided, you know what, that, that'd be a great opportunity. He was really inspired by it and um, he decided that he would go. So they found out about a gentleman named John Braidwood. And at the time, he was in London, England, and he had started a few schools for the deaf there. So they decided that Thomas Gallaudet would travel to London, England to study under John Braidwood. So he took this long boat journey over to England. And when he arrived, John Braidwood was not very accepting of Thomas Gallaudet. He didn't want to teach him. In fact, he so much as refused to teach him how to work with the students who are deaf over there at his school. And while this was disappointing, Thomas Gallaudet saw that what he could see, most of John, Bra John Braidwood's teachings had to do with lip reading and speech training. So basically, he was teaching them an oral method. And Thomas Gallaudet felt that that wasn't good enough. There had to have been a better way than to just force someone who was deaf to talk, to learn to speak. It didn't seem natural. So Thomas Gallaudet set out to try and discover better methods. So while in England, he happened to meet a gentleman by the name of Abby Saccard. And Abby Saccard was the director of a school in Paris, France for the deaf. And with Abby, he had two of his faculty members, Laurent Clerc and John Michou. They were both highly educated graduates of the school for the deaf that he was the director of in Paris, France. And through the discussion with Abby Saccard, Abby welcomed Thomas Gallaudet to come to Paris, France with him to study under his methods. And at the time, um, Thomas Gallaudet, he was very much on board and really wanted to go and study underneath Abby Saccard, but he was running out of money. So he was able to get in touch with Dr. Cogswell and ask for more funding in order to go to Paris, France. And once he was in Paris, France, studying under Abby Saccard um, with the help of his faculty members, both Laurent Clerc and Jean Massou, he was able to see that their methods, in fact, were not trying to force um, the deaf students to lip read or to have speech training. They were using a method called French Sign Language. And using French Sign Language, they were able to communicate with the students who were deaf and he was able to study and learn French Sign Language as well as observe the different teaching methods that they used when communicating with them. And through that, he was fascinated and he learned a lot. But after a while, he knew it was really time for him to go back to Hartford, Connecticut to try and start up that first school in America for the deaf. Um, I also have a picture of Laurent Clerc. So, knowing that he needed to go back to Hartford, and knowing, in fact, that Thomas Gallaudet was not quite ready to go back, he didn't feel that he knew enough sign language, French sign language, to take that method back to America. And he needed the help 
of someone that was at that deaf school. So he approached Abby Sicard, Lament Clerk, and Jean Massou, and he asked for someone to come back to America with him. And he really focused on Lament Clerk. And he pretty much begged him because at the time, Laurent Clerc did not want to go back to America. His home was in Paris, France. He enjoyed teaching and working at the School for the Deaf to help those students in France learn French Sign Language and be able to be educated and to communicate. And so there was a lot of maybe begging and persuading for Laurent Clerc to go. And he did finally agree to go, but he only agreed to go for a short term to help get something started, to get things underway, and then he had plans of returning back to France. So Thomas Gallaudet took what he could, and he said, that'd be wonderful. I'll have you for a few years, you'll teach me everything you know, and I would be very appreciative of that. So they got on the boat, and they took their trip to America. While on the boat, Laurent Clerc continued to teach Thomas Gallaudet sign language. And Thomas Gallaudet taught Laurent Clerc English. Now, you might be wondering, how? How did he teach him English? Because what I've learned about Thomas Gallaudet is that he didn't agree with the oral method, so he wouldn't have agreed to force Laurent Clerc to speak or to talk. But instead, it was discovered that Laurent Clerc really enjoyed keeping a daily journal, and he would write down what happened every day. And through that daily journal, Thomas Gallaudet would read through it, and he would write out what his message was in English to teach Laurent Clerc the English words um, from the French words that he had written. And Laurent Clerc would take what was written, and he would rewrite that to help him learn the written English, into a nice leather, hard-stitched, um, hard-bound leather book. So he took his French journal and translated it each and every day into English to practice learning written English. I think that this really neat. Um, took a lot of effort on both their behalves. So arriving in America, it was made possible that in 1817, in Hartford, Connecticut, the both of them, Thomas Gallaudet and Laurent Clerc, established the first school for the deaf. It was called the Institution for Deaf Mutes. Then it was later renamed the American Asylum at Hartford for the education and instruction of the deaf and dumb. And then it was renamed a third time the American School for the Deaf. Here's a picture of what it looked like when it first opened or maybe during the first couple of years, and a picture of what it looks like now. Because of this school for the deaf, they needed teachers. And therefore, Laurent Clerc became the first deaf teacher for the deaf students at this school. And he liked it so much that he did end up staying for over 40 years here in America teaching at that deaf school. We also know that because of the American School for the Deaf, other schools started popping up for the deaf as well in other large cities. Those students who had come to the school were starting to learn French Sign Language, but history has told us that through researching American Sign Language, while it is heavily influenced, about 60% of American Sign Language is heavily influenced by French Sign Language, but there's that other 40% that isn't really connected or related in any way to French Sign Language. And it is believed that because of Martha's Vineyard, when they opened that first school for the deaf in Hartford, Connecticut, that there were children from Martha's Vineyard that went to that school. And because of that, and because of the Martha's Vineyard sign language that was already established on the island, there were signs that possibly came from that island and maybe even signs from other areas in America where there may have been a few deaf people, not large populations, but a few, 
that they were able to add in some of these other signs that had already been established in America. And so when you look at French Sign Language and you look at Martha's Vineyard Sign Language, together, the both of them make up the whole of what we call Old American Sign Language. And through its standardization, um, it became what we now know as Modern American Sign Language. Now you might be wondering, why didn't Martha's Vineyard Sign Language just become American Sign Language? Um, and, and the reasons behind that and what a lot of people believe is that um, because those people typically just stayed on the island, that it didn't spread. And while it spread on the island, it didn't spread through the mainland. And it also never became standardized like American Sign Language did today. So although there are influences that come from that island, it's really a combination of both together that have been created in American Sign Language. And um, some of the similarities between French Sign Language is the alphabet itself um, in France, they use a one-handed alphabet where all of your letters are on one hand, um, just the same as when we use American Sign Language today, they are all on one hand. Um, and we know that through these journeys that it really didn't have any influence, or, or London, England, the sign language that they use now in England really didn't have much of an influence on American Sign Language we know because John Braidwood also turned Gallaudet down, but also because some of their signs are very, very different. Um, and for example, their alphabet. They have a two-handed alphabet where you would use both hands to form the letters A, B, C, D, and so on. Um, so you can look and, and see some of those different studies on how closely related French Sign Language and American Sign Language are and how different American Sign Language is from some of those other uh, countries. Now, because there were not a ton of um, schools for the deaf in America at that time, there would be students or children that would come from all over America to this school for the deaf. They'd travel really far, and parents would basically send their child there. It was not uncommon for a child to grow up in a school for the deaf. And perhaps that was because of how far it was and the inadequate transportation, but because of that, it started um, the establishment of communities of deaf people around those schools. So they would um, either stick around and form communities near the schools, and then the other thing that would happen is that those kids that would graduate from those schools for the deaf um, would go back maybe to their hometown and then end up also being involved in establishing a school for the deaf in that area. And thus began the formation of all these different schools for the deaf around America and kind of spread the language and spread the education for the deaf. So that was something that um, was very important that we were able to provide many people who were deaf the education that they needed. Now, in 1864, Thomas Hopkins Gallaudet's son, Edward Minor Gallaudet, helped to establish a national college for deaf students named in honor of his father, Gallaudet University. Now, Edward became the college's first president there, and that was the first college that provided education beyond just the um, American School for the Deaf. They were able to get a scholar in education to further um, their ability to impact history and to um, be an active participant in America. Now, the development of American Sign Language really has given the deaf community a chance to show the world that they really are, who they really are, excuse me, through their amazing and expressive body language. And because of ASL, to the deaf and hard of hearing have a sense of belonging and community, and they have really changed history forever. I hope you've enjoyed this lesson. I hope you get a sense of how American Sign Language came about, um, because it wasn't something that just magically popped up. Um, but it did have different influences from all over. And we appreciate those people who took an interest in 
wanting to communicate with the deaf and not accepting that um, they couldn't communicate. So something like that was very big back then that Thomas Gallaudet would be able to travel and be inspired to learn a language that would allow him to communicate with the deaf and hard of hearing and how that was able to spread through America and has greatly affected um, those who are deaf and hard of hearing today to enable them to communicate through the use of American Sign Language and other modes of sign language as well. All right, I hope you've enjoyed my, my lesson and I'll see you next time. Thanks.